Podtackler, the unofficial Halo Universe podcast presents episode 846, Terminal Velocity Chief, recorded live on January 12th, 2023. Hello everyone, welcome to Pod Tackler, the unofficial Halo Universe podcast. I am one of your co-hosts, Death Storm. I'm your other co-host, Godzilla T. And it's another light week, being the second week back into the new year. A little uh, bit. Don't have, yeah, don't have a lot to talk about yet as far as new Halo stuff. There's some new HCS info, which we'll dive into a little bit. Of course, we've got some playlist updates that we'll cover, and we're also going to discuss our next two missions for the Halo Infinite campaign, Spire and Pelican Down. Uh, we'll get through uh, some submissions that we got in our Discord. If you all want to be part of the discussion that we're having on our podcast, head on over to podtackler.com slash Discord and join the community and the conversation. But as we normally do, we've got our little community wrap-up, starting with how did Frag and Friday go last week? GT, and before we do that, thank you, Ace, for the sub. Appreciate it, and welcome to the stream. And thanks, Pins, for the 10 gift subs. Oh, did he give some? Oh my gosh, I missed those. Oh my. Oh, that's where that came from. Never mind. I'm a little behind, folks. Sorry, the stream pins dropped 10 gifts of subs. If you have your bingo card, go ahead and fill in that space. Yes. I don't think I have that bingo card space, actually. So screw you, pins. Anyways, uh, <laughs> how was game night last, last week, GT? Uh, it, was, it was a lot of fun. Uh, we spent most of the night matchmaking. Uh, we did wrap up the night with a few custom games. We tried out a couple of new ones. Very good. They may or may not return. <laughs> you try. We're some, working wait, on what it. Kind of, what kind of customs did you try? Because I've played a few that, and most of the ones I've played have been pretty good so far. Honestly, I would have to look, which I guess I could. Well, while you're doing that, we'll have another if, a night of Halo Infinite. So if you all want to join us for Fragment Friday. Head on over to uh, Twitch. You can watch us at 8.30 p.m. Eastern Time or send a message to GT on Xbox. It's Godzilla Space T if you want an invite to the game. Start off with matchmaking, head into customs. I will not be there uh, this week either, or if I am on, it will be late. Uh, my birthday is tomorrow, and I'm having people over to celebrate. I'm cooking steak and chicken and shrimp and people mm, are bringing sides good. and dessert so yeah it'll be fun well one of them we played was uh sky castle wars i just saw that one while i was playing through uh the last the two campaign missions that we're talking about just going through the file browser and i saw that one I haven't played it yet but saw that one it's interesting it is Castle Wars. Okay. You get a sword. Uh, you also get a... Re was it a repulsor? Uh, I mean, that would make sense. No. Um, Maybe I have to this Never once. mind. It gives you an insane number of overshields. Okay. And bots are enabled. Really? Yes. Okay. So if you don't have a full team, it will substitute bots in for you. And okay. from what I can gather, they're Spartan bots. I didn't look in the game type settings to find out. But you get an insane, and I mean insane, number of overshields. Is it like constantly regenerating? Is that why? Well, it it's a constant pickup. It respawns almost instantly. Like every time I every time I looked over at the spawn, there was one there, and okay. uh, it, it's kind of a different twist on Castle Wars. <laughs> okay, I think just a regular Castle Wars type game type would work better. I'm sure there's someone but that's personal one preference. And then we uh, we also did uh, a game of Rocket Slayer on uh, a map called Game Type or Game Night. 
It is okay. A living room with all your sounds like randoms. You know, well, sounds like randoms. No, it's just rockets only. Okay. Rockets well, I mean, only. like the map sounds like like a randoms map type thing. It it could be. It it's similar to randoms, uh, except for it is themed. It okay. has um, damn it. Uh, it has like a Monopoly board, Connect Four battleships. Oh. There's a pizza box with a pizza in it. <laughs> That's cool. There is, I think, Jenga's on there. Just, uh, you know, your classic, a lot of your classic board games. Uh, and that's the map. That's kind of cool. So it, it it was interesting. Is the map just the table where those games are on, or is it like a Pretty room? Pretty much. Yeah, it's just a table. I mean, it is a room, but the play area is the table. Gotcha. Cool. That's pretty clever. Mm-hmm. Games within games. Now, it'd be interesting if you could play those games within Halo. Within the game? With the scripting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, there, you know, like there's a chessboard on there. It's, I, I recommend taking a look at it. it. It's a neat map. I really like it. It's called Game Night. And it is by uh, Red Numster and Carbon Plex TTV. Okay. Sounds good. And if you want to come play it with us, come and join us on Friday nights. <clears throat> yeah, that one that one will probably stay. The uh, whole Castle Wars thing, probably. The map will probably stay. The game type will probably change. <laughs> Got it. I still want to do some kind of like tackler specific Husky Raid in Castle Wars. So if anyone that's listening wants to build a tackler themed Castle Wars or Husky Raid map, let us know. I'll even make a prefab of the Pottacular helmet. Try to <laughs> let work in there it. somehow. Right. Now we got Fuchs in the room. Hey, Fuchs. Very nice. Well, hopefully... And I did find another one that we didn't play last night, so we'll probably play it again. We'll probably try it tomorrow. Mini Tanks. Oh. It's basically just the turret. Oh, jeez. <laughs> Okay. Well, with tanks in Infinite, if you shrink the tank, everything the shrinks stays. except the turret. Okay. So it's just I could a bunch see of turrets running around. You know what would be funny is if when you shot the tank round because of how small you are, it actually shoots you backwards, too. I don't know that it doesn't. I don't Fair know enough. if the physics work that way in Infinite or can be we set to work that way, but yeah, you're right. We will see. That'd be hilarious. <laughs> yeah, it would be. All right. So no achieving Halo yet. I haven't brought that back yet, but I am looking to start streaming again and might do that as one of those stream things. So stay tuned to that. Uh, we got uh, one thing from the community this week that got uh, sent in. This one is from uh, Himothy, who got an overkill on Guardian and Halo 3. Pretty good overkill. Mm -hmm. Some couple, couple good clean headshots and cleanups. So thanks, Timothy, for sharing over in the Clip Shots channel. On the Halo news front, nothing news wise from Halo Waypoint, but we do have a couple of things on Twitter that we can talk about. Starting with a couple of matchmaking updates for MCC Halo 3 Hardcore doubles and ranked. Uh, Halo Reach Combat Evolved Anniversary have returned to MCC. And in Halo Infinite, we've got Rumble Pit live. Mm -hmm. And the funny thing is, is they're all, all the game types in Rumble Pit are party game, game types. There's no just Slayer. That's good. When I go into Rumble Pit, I want to be playing, I'm looking to play Slayer. Yeah. Looking for I mean, some kind of Don't get me wrong, the party game modes I like and they're fun. They need an action sack playlist for those. Or okay. some version of it. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that, that kind of makes sense. You know, the core playlists, you know, your team slayer or SWAT or whatever they want to call it. You know, big team. The rotational. Big team's a little different because it is kind of a party game mode in itself. So having different variants of big team, fine. Yep. But 
know. I mean, I can in Rumble, I could see, you know, different variations of Slayer, you know, like Sword Slayer or Rocket Slayer or, you know, things like that. Mm-hmm. But kind of themed like the what do they call the one with the low gravity needler? Oh, you know, I just I the, the wacky game types. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I think those are better suited for like a 4v4 playlist. Sack. Yeah. I was thinking that too, Pens. I was thinking Team Bubble Bath. <laughs> it's actually not too cl- too far from it, but other than the fact that you're not restricted into a small area, which if somebody would like to recreate Team Bubble Bath, it will show up on the game night. Yes. I have to go find that game mode. You can take that as far as you want. You can make a little arena, or you can build the whole map, and then Build the little arena on the end of the map. I, I've I have an idea. <laughs> Just needs to have some water on it, obviously, because you need the bath part of the bubble bath. Yeah, and I think they figured out how to make somewhat realistic water. It doesn't, of course, it doesn't react to people walking through it, but it at least looks somewhat realistic. I've seen forgers, yeah, do some stuff with that. Just have to go find a tutorial. I ain't build it. I would if I had time, or I would work with someone to build it if I had time. I'll say that. Year two of HES is kicking off, with the first stop being Charlotte, North Carolina in February. The end of February 24th through the 26th, we're going to be able to see more drops on Twitch. It's a $250,000 4v4 prize pool and a $5,000 FFA prize pool. Team passes are available January 19th. Spectator tickets, three, both general admission three-day and VIP three-days are currently available. We've got different uh, teams that have pre-qualified from last year that are going to be coming straight in, and then there's going to be an open bracket part of it. So yeah, if you want to he- see more information, head on over to Halo.gg. For those that are interested in the details of what's going to be played, because we've actually been getting a few updates from Tashi on some of the changes that have been going on Twitter and now they're all nice consolidated into a little article over on Halo Waypoint. We're getting Capture the Flag on Argyle and Empyrean, which are of course two new maps since the first season of HCS. And Aquarius Slayer on Empyrean, Aquarius Life Fire, Recharge, and Streets. King of the Hill on Recharge, Life Fire, and Streets. Strongholds on Recharge, Life Fire, and Streets. And Oddball on Recharge, Life Fire, and Streets. There's a lot of balance updates as well. I like some of the uh, these some of these balance updates really intrigue me. Like the yep. remo- removal of fusion coils. Yeah, that was a big discussion in the competitive community, which was kind of interesting to hear. Like I uh, Yeah, it's like I mean, isn't that one of the improvements that was made to the Halo match or Halo multiplayer is the ability to throw fusion coils and now they're removing I think them? it's too casual. I think that's. I'm I'm uh, all for leave it in there. I'm all for let let's let some mayhem. Anybody happen. ever watch me try to kill somebody with a freaking fusion coil? It doesn't work. <laughs> Just because like pros think it's a, like an easy <sighs> kill or something, or I'm I'm not exactly sure what the reason is behind people not wanting it. Half it's the like, kills they get are cheap kills. Like they need manipulate to have a little bit- the sandbox to get the effect they want. And like the thing is, if you see someone coming around with it, you just shoot the shoot the, coil. the explosive, and it, it blows them up. So it's it's the risk reward of picking it up and possibly getting it blown out of your hands, or surviving and getting it thrown off and hitting somebody. So I, I don't know. Anyway, I just I find that cannon, interesting. Yeah, the scrap cannon kind of makes a little bit of sense. Turrets in four v four competitive have never really been a thing, so that makes sense. It, you know, honestly. I don't see a lot of people jumping on them. At least I would, you know, in a competitive environment, I wouldn't because you're stationary. I played a team Slayer yesterday and there were people using those things. I mean, in a competitive. And... Well, yeah. You're talking about the cream of the crop. They are going to peel your butt off of that cannon in a heartbeat. So it just makes no makes sense to remove it because in competitive, you're not going to use it. 
So that's fine. Yeah, but it's the aesthetics of the map. It's eh. not the map without the turrets. Eh. It's not the map anyway. The neon, whatever they call it. <laughs> I still have. The, I um, still have yet to go see the super thing. sandwich. I haven't gone either. I forgot that was a thing. Yep. Drop wall charges change from two to one, which is interesting because a drop wall is still kind of useless. Unless you really place it out ahead of time, in which case it does help. I mean, thankfully they have buffed the shield where it's not just paper thin, but yeah, it's still the deployment is very the slow. deployment of it is really based on where you place it. If you look straight down and deploy it, it actually deploys pretty quickly. When you throw it, it takes longer for it to deploy. True. I'm so used to the way the Halo 3 shield deploys, where you just throw it out and it instantly comes yeah. out. So that's my instinct as far as throwing that out there. But it also, well, one, it was a stronger shield, but it was also a smaller shield. Yes, that's true. Uh, updates to ammo racks and weapon racks, fra um, frags, other things to the sandbox. Uh, this one, I think, is just good overall. Uh, updates. Uh, that they're making overall to just the sound effect for footsteps, making it um, harder to hear at a distance and easier to hear when when you're up close. That's something I would actually think I would I would appreciate in regular matchmaking. Well, no, I think I think this is. No, I mean updates are across coming across matchmaking, all, all all across matchmaking, not just for ranked play. No, I don't think this is just a ranked play. It's just feature, for ranked play, for rank. And ACS only. Hmm. I don't see that in the... Update 1. Empyrean, Argyle, Tuesday, January 10th. Ranked and HCS only. That's for update 1, though. That's yeah, because I that's think that the applies map, to all of them. Combo. No, it's, it's... Sandbox stuff is usually global. So I'm pretty sure these updates are going to also be... This is going to be across the board. Really? <laughs> Yes, really. I believe it's going to be. No, I'm just... just for those of you that are listening, my cat decided to play with his jingle ball. Uh, didn't even hear it. I did. Okay. Anyway, <laughs> back to the list. The recording. Yeah. And then in season three, I guess they'll be evaluating whether or not to add these in the competitive. There'll be the shroud screen and the bandit, bandit rifle. I'm looking forward to actually playing with the bandit rifle. Yeah. I want to see what what Infinite's take on the DMR is. Right. You will see. So those are the updates for HCS for the season. I currently am not planning to go to Charlotte. I have considered it. Probably won't with the puppy and everything, but it's not completely out of the question yet. My brother lives in Durham, so it just kind of popped down there. Just pop we'll in. He's popping. He's actually visiting uh, this weekend. So, not necessarily for my birthday, but they're coming up to visit someone else in DC and then just stopping over. He's going to take stop the puppy by, with huh? you. I'd have to find a hotel that would take a puppy, Pins. I don't know if that's. I thought you were going to stay with your brother. That's true. They didn't think about this. I, I, <laughs> I haven't given it much thought. Then that just goes to show how little thought I've actually given to it. There is a joint fire event starting on January 17th where you, there will be the Covert One flag uh, making its return. And I guess there will be the JFO class armor to unlock as well. So that comes next week. Yep. And then it's here for two weeks. And then one other thing I'm going to mention just because it's deliciousness, but there is currently a promotion with Xbox over in the EU where people can get packs of specially marked Oreos that have different Xbox buttons on them. And then you can enter in a code to unlock a specific armor skin in Halo Infinite as one of the things that you can unlock with it. So if any of our UK or EU listeners care to buy us a pack and Tell us how to unlock the code. Uh, we will be happy for that because <laughs> the armor coating is actually pretty cool with the speckled blue. 
I don't know if, if you've seen it or not, GT, but... No, I haven't. That's true. I mean, I don't know if Receptor listens that often anymore, Pins, but yes, that is true. Receptor would be a good person to reach out to. That's all the Halo updates that we have. So let's go ahead and move on to our topic then, which is going to be the Spire and Pelican Down missions in Halo Infinite campaign. So, Spire. I forgot how short Spire was. It's not that long. And it technically starts after your encounter with the Harbinger the first time. So there's the little navigation down the valley and have to kill off the two hunters, which I went back and played it today and listening to some of the dialogue, I didn't realize that was the first time you actually encounter hunters in the game. Uh, and I think that's also the first time in this place in effect later on, but the first time the weapon snaps her fingers like Cortana does when she activates the lift into the spire. I think it's the first time. No, I think she does it. She does it earlier than that. Honestly, I can't say that I really pay attention to that particular part of it. Uh, you know, <laughs> the, honestly, I didn't even realize it until almost the end of the game when she realized it. The first, you know, the first couple of times I played through. Same. Uh, I'm like, wait a minute. Cortana used to do that all the time. Yep. Well, when she actually became visible. <clears throat> right. So, throughout all of Halo 2, yep, you saw yeah. her snap a lot. I, I don't think, did she do it in Halo CE at all? We never saw her in CE. Yeah, we did. Not like we did in Halo 2, 3, 4, 5? No, not, not no, nearly five. as often, no. I mean, the only time that we saw her was in the control room. Yeah, I don't think we saw her snap her fingers. Well, the control room and on the pillar of pillar bottom. Pillar bottom, yeah. Yeah, and she didn't snap her fingers when she activated the timer because she did the whole thinking with her head and then looked over. So I guess, yeah, Halo 2 was the first time she really snapped yeah. her fingers. Here, let me translate that for you. Penn said that the first time she snapped her fingers was at Outpost Tremonius. Was it that early on? Oh, yeah, when she uh, takes over the fob in that scene. Well, that would have been after Outpost Tremonius. No, when you take Outpost Tremonius. Oh, gotcha. You know, when you... Okay. I'm sorry, when you capture Outpost Tremonius. Gotcha. Okay. So, I don't know if you want to count that as getting a Halo Fact wrong on the bingo card, but... Well, there you go. So, yeah, the Spire part, not... I mean, it, it, I think it's more setting up the the second act mm -hmm. of, or I guess maybe, I don't know if you call it the second act or third act kind of of the campaign at this point. I don't know if you consider everything leading up to Outpost Tremonius as act one, and then maybe from there, while you're on the ring, up to Spire is act two or something. But it's kind of the setup point to the next major piece of the campaign, which is going to be going to all the different Spires and activating them. So, act two or three, more or less. <laughs> yeah, and then, then you get the idea of how actually expansive this area is. Yep. Oh, my God. It's, that was a long flight. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yep. It's a long time to listen to the booster on an, a banshee. <laughs> Going from and then you let off. Far side. Yep. It takes a while. That's for sure. Thinking about making a macro so I can just push a button and it just do it for me. <laughs> Hold down the button, release it for five seconds. Hold down the button, release it for five seconds. Believe it or not, I did that for Destiny the other day. Oh, really? There's a trick that you can use to get materials, and you have to dismantle a lot of stuff to do that. So I literally created a macro that I just put my mouse over the item I wanted to delete and just touch the button and it just, and I just, guess I can go get a drink or get whatever. A drink. Yep. And then I get, you know, when I get done, I turn it off. <laughs> there you go. We get introduced to despondent pyre in the spire or sorry, not despondent pyre, uh, adjutant resolution, the other monitor in here. 
and a little bit of story and the whole development of what the spires are, blah, 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 blah. Story development, how they're supporting the reformation of the ring. And then we go and stop it because, of course, we don't want the banished to have. We don't want the banished to fix the ring. Yep. And And apparently he takes a, a. objection to that i mean we've we've kind of been here before (laughs) in you know until he beats four tank guns i am absolutely surprised how long he lasted with four tank guns hitting him yep depends on all where you hit him because it took me only three tank guns when i was running through it today but then i was only on normal we were playing on normal were we yeah you just have to hit the the we spots. are all just really bad shots. <laughs> <laughs> we weren't aiming for the critical points. Obviously yeah. not. I guess not. But yeah, this mission is pretty short. There's the fob that you can get before you go up the spire. There's a couple of Spartan cores that you can get as well. And uh, I think one or two different Marine squads that are technically in that area. So you can do that if you're doing all the side missions. There's also the highest point on Zeta Halo. So if you want to go for that achievement, that's also here. After you capture the fob, you get a little blurb from the weapon that the highest point of the ring is up there. So it's kind of at least a clue. Um, And there is a Marine Believe it or not, I got that one totally by accident. I did kind of go looking for it. I, I didn't. I just I got it by accident. I I knew it was an achievement, so I actually went to go. I went after it specifically. But, I mean, the other nice thing is that there is a Marine fire team squad up there that you can go and save. So, while you're up there, you just kind of make your way to the top and you just bleep bloop get the achievement. And, yeah, so that's all, everything in the Spire area. I did something fun tonight where once you get to the elevator part that goes up, I actually hopped off the pad. By the time it gets up into the section where it goes up into the loading zone, the platform comes screaming back down and then it's like slows down within 25 meters and comes down gently. <laughs> but it like goes from going up to... <clears throat> was there a sonic boom as it went by? No. I was thinking there that the monitor might say something quibby or funny if you just wait a while or don't get on the elevator and no, nothing happened. I still love the animation they do for uh, the pilot when you don't look at his light. (laughs) That's hilarious. I haven't actually done that yet. So I actually did it uh, on stream one night Hmm. when I was streaming on my own channel. I just sat there. Just kind of just, Sat there and wait, and he's like, looking at him, Chief, hey, it's up there. <laughs> Little quibs. He didn't, say, he didn't say anything. He just kind of looks up, and it's like, yep. anytime now. Come on. on. Kind of made me wonder if there was something like that in, in the other games. I don't think there is, but There's I'm going to have to go back and look. In a lot of different things, yeah. Pence said three through three missed an opportunity for a nostalgia trip with the whole crazy fool. Why do you always jump? Although I think the callback was kind of there when Chief just runs off the spire. Yeah. You got you got the Halo 2 callback, you've got the Halo 4 callback when he jumps off of that spire uh onto the Lich. Mm-hmm. What else? What other times is he just jumping out of things and there's gotta be a couple other things. But yeah, that was a definitely a callback of I need exfiltration now and the pilot's coming in the pelican, you see it. And then Chief's just like whoop! And the pilot's like really? I'm <laughs> Although, leaving now! <laughs> with how high up that he's falling and with how tall the spire looks it doesn't feel like it's that high. It but, doesn't feel like it's high enough to pull off the maneuver you see. Yeah, but it also doesn't feel like that he was actually that high up like from when he jumps off and start going down from where the spire is but I mean it's all in game so I'm guessing it is height accurate which means that you well let's just say uh, yeah, what's the terminal velocity of a Spartan 
I mean, he's pretty freaking thick. <laughs> he's also pretty damn heavy. So terminal velocity is going to be a lot faster than just a nor- normal person, at least. Yeah, it, it will be. And then you have the pelican screaming in front of him, nose down, pointed at the ground. So, I mean, it, it just sometimes, you know, from the trip up, um, it didn't feel like the heights were the same. <laughs> yep. Yep. That's exactly it seemed what like I was... once chief jumped off the spire, all of a sudden got taller. That's, that's what it felt like. So right. I don't know if they did some cutscene magic or, or what there. There may have been a little adjustment to the height of the spire, you know, there, there one may or have been. 200 feet. <laughs> just, just for the cutscene, you know, there may have been. If we okay, had theater mode, terminal velocity of a Spartan. If we had theater mode, we could probably find out. Probably. Three, four, three, theater mode for campaign. That'd be nice. And then we've got the E3 <laughs> relive on the island, mm-hmm. on the Pelican Dan Island. So that was the whole reliving of of that part. When you first played the Pelican Down mission, did you actually follow the path that they did in E3 and going to the one that's right in front of you, or did you peel off somewhere else? I Do actually think I followed the E3 E3 well direction. I won't say I followed the exact path. Yeah, yeah, like going to the that spire in front of you. Yeah, I, I, I'm pretty sure I went. To, I pretty sure I went that you know just to that same spire first. Okay. I mean, you know, I, it's right there. <laughs> yeah. I think I actually went to the southeast one first on my first run through. Yeah. Not we did sure find why out did the that. Spar- the spires are far enough apart that you will be sucked back to your fire team. You mean the anti air turrets? The anti air turrets, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the two that are by each other on the far right, yeah, they're they're just far enough away from each other. <laughs> oh, I think I remember. I went towards that way because I was searching for data pads and Spartan cores, and I figured there'd be some in the wreckage of the which there are frigates and stuff. So I probably went in that direction and then just kept going in that direction looking for more. So I just followed that direction to the other to that first anti air turret. Yeah, for me, the first playthrough was all about the story. I didn't care about the collectibles. I mean, if I came across something, I picked it up. But I didn't go out hunting for them. I had the dual purpose of wanting to beat the campaign, because obviously having it early as a forerunner, but also finding all the collectibles first. Well, yeah, I mean, if I was in that situation, I would have played through the campaign for the story, and then I would have immediately went back and picked up all the collectibles. The the three anti-air turrets, the kind of, or at least the two with the interruption from Eshram, help kind of build that tension and story well. And just every time we, we saw Eshram in, in one of these holograms, like just the presence and the grandeur of, of how Eshram really built up this tension between chief and him and like gearing up towards this fight and really saying that this, like this is our story. This is our time, which it kind of really plays into the whole, Halo Infinite story. So I really... They did really well with the script for Eshram. And Mm -hmm. the actor did an awesome job of just making him terrifying. Yes. Yeah, he's he's Along with the art team. He has got to be the most vicious looking brute we've seen yet. Mm Mm-hmm. Eshram is probably one of the best... I I don't want to say villain, because he's not really built as a villain but definitely as an antagonist to the story the whole banish storyline has just been like i think that's one of has been one of the best story things that 343 has created during their tenure of the halo universe it's just the banished in that whole faction and what their stance is within the universe and how they do things and like the flood had a certain terrifying aspect to it Especially I was introduced just like, oh, it's this parasite that can take out life as we know it across the galaxy. 
well, now you have the Banished, which is a little bit more of a traditional faction that we've seen in sci-fi, but the threat is felt and known and made present in the way that they're presented, which is done so incredibly well. Pins put in the uh, chat here, a Spartan, the terminal velocity of a Spartan based on Master Chief is 354.9248 feet per second. So how how far did he fall? Or how long did he fall? That's, that's 242 miles an hour, which is twice the terminal velocity of a human, apparently. <laughs> yeah. So how how far did how how long did we, how long was I can see? <laughs> and, and that's assuming that the atmosphere is is the same atmosphere as it would be on Earth. Well, I would imagine since it's an Earth like biodome, that it would be. It but you don't, it, it could be a it could be a uh, assumption. How thick is the atmosphere yeah. on the halo ring compared to how much it would be on the planet? But also, gravity differences. We don't know that you're actually at 1G on a halo ring. Right. But all things being equal, so let's see. He fell for what, like five seconds? Oh, it was longer than that. It was a good 15 seconds between when he jumped off and you see the pelican coming in and then the pelican lining up. It was probably a good 10 to 15 seconds. That whole thing. You doing some math? So that's about 5,400 feet. Hmm. It's about 1.7 kilometers. 5,400 feet. Or no, sorry. Wrong conversion. No, that's the right conversion. Yeah, well, 1.7 kilometers, something like that. <laughs> Pence just watched the cutscene. 16 seconds. Hey, I was close. You were close. I was pretty close. Anyways, on to Pelican Down. Or we kind of already started Pelican Down. Um, yeah, just kind of going around the, the, the story with Eshram and doing all the, the turrets, um, kind of the interaction with him and then the weapon in chief thought it was really good story building moments. Like you still have quite a bit of action going to each turret to basically, all right, got to clear things out so we can get back on mission but still building that story and building that tension. And like, I feel like this was almost like a mini climax to the story. It's kind of like a little bit of a ramp up, especially with the Spartan killers at the end of Pelican down, which I thought that fight was actually pretty difficult. It was, um, for the first time playing with through on legendary. That was hard. Well, Doing it on Lasso wasn't easy either. No. But I think that... My first time going through Legendary, I feel like that battle was almost on the same difficulty as when you're actually going against Eshram. Because Eshram, like, you at least have a little bit more close base, so there's not as many tactics that you can use there. But because of how open and the range that the Spartan killers have in that open space during that mission, like you poke your head out just to try to get a shot on them with BR or rockets or anything. They're shooting right back at you and they're putting more damage into you than you can to them. It, so. You know, honestly of all the fights, save the Harbinger fight, the Harbinger fight, I have to admit is probably the toughest one of the bunch. I would agree with that. That one's right there at second uh, of all the boss fights you do in the game on any difficulty. Mm hmm. It's the that fight is the one that takes the most challenge, minus having the tank gun, you know, fighting it yes. like you're supposed to, as intended. Yep. The nice thing is, is uh, how I wound up doing it is I actually climbed that mountain right there, and at the very top of that the mountain there's a sniper rifle, along with uh, I think an Arbiter doll. Yep, the modified sniper rifle. So that helped a bunch. Okay. Yeah, if you can get far enough away with, from them where the turret can't reach, then that definitely helps. You just have to make sure you have enough ammo to pump into the sucker. Yeah. 
I mean, the, yeah, the chopper, if he could get away from the chopper long enough to take care of the other one, then it got a little easier. When you're trying to deal with both of them at the same time, it was pain. Yep. Isolating them from each other is definitely a strategy I used several times. Or you just take tank guns and send one of them into orbit. Well, this before the tank gun, but yes. (laughs) You know, I'm honestly kind of glad I didn't know about tank gun on my first playthrough. Same. You know, it, don't get me wrong, tank gun's fun and everything when you're goofing off, but it really honestly takes away from the story. It does. There's a certain part of it that it is good to go through and actually be able to play it as the developers intended. And with that means there's certain difficulty and certain uphill battles that you're meant to experience because you're, you're trying to tell the story of, Hey, this is a difficult part of chief's adventure through this. And it's meant to be difficult for a reason. So it feels a certain feeling to it. And the tank is just like, <laughs> get out of the way. But yes, it's definitely worth doing it with even like first time on legendary doing the missions as intended without the the cheats or unintended things. Yeah. I will use the skulls. I don't care. <laughs> Fair enough. Skulls are not cheating. That's not a glitch. They're modifiers. They are modifiers, yes. But they're not a glitch in the game. They're not an exploit. They're there. True. And everything's better with infinite rockets. <laughs> Bandana skull is nice. I still cannot believe for the Lazo achievement that they allowed the bandana skull to be active. Well, it's legendary all skulls on. True, but it's also no the benefit skulls are the ones that are disabled in a typical lasso run. Mm, I mean, if you look at Lazo in in Lazo in it, MCC you don't get any of the good skulls. You don't get the non-scoring skulls. Right. Which bandana right. is one. Okay, I see what you mean. You get all the you get all the skulls that well, hurt no, you. No, hang on. Like Cowbell for Halo CE is on. Yes. I think there's some of the non-scoring skulls that are on for Lazo. None of them that well, I mean you you get Sputnik, you can get Cowbell, uh, which don't get me wrong, are helpful. Sorta. Um, other than they make explosions bigger, which can be quite dangerous, but which yes, it is, is quite dangerous. Not can be is, but you know, the fun skulls, really make sure you keep your distance. Yeah. The, I mean, you can turn on like grand birthday party, cowbell, I would have been your daddy, those skulls. Cause they don't really modify the game that much. Not like a bandana would or grunt funeral or the uh, scarab gun. <laughs> yeah. Or what's the new flying skull? Acrophobia. The acrophobia skull. So anyway, I mean, just in tradition, skulls that really helped you were not part of the lasso run. Fair point. Historically. Anyway. That's fair. But. Yeah, that was, uh, I mean, even a normal, that was, that was a pain, pain in the butt fight. <laughs> I was not ready for that it one. It was one of the tough ones. Yeah. The last thing I want to mention about Pelican Down 2 is the part at the end where you go find the pilot and that whole interaction between the pilot and Chief and the weapon. I thought the voice acting was great. The animation on the pilot, though, was just really underwhelming. Like you know, the vocal honestly, it's really hit it, but like part of that animation just really sucked it out. Yeah, it really I, it, it didn't bother me because by that point, I was so looking for the pilot story that I wasn't really paying attention to video quality. I was more listening. Although, when the chief kneels down next to the pilot and whole screen shakes, it's like, cool. 
a half ton super soldier. I, I, I will tell you, I've said this before in infinite, it gives you such a different perspective of scale of all the stuff that we've known for years, but you've never really had a good comparison, like in cutscenes and stuff. It's like chief nails, ne- kneels down next to the pilot and the pilot doesn't even come up to the guy's armpit. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's like, and you know, like his chest is like, whoa, you're looking at four feet of chest with not or thick, not with anyway. Um, you just, I don't know, just something they did with the camera angles in this game. It really made a lot more of the enemies feel, uh, well, even chief feel a lot more larger than life. It's like when you first come up on Chuck lock up to that point, he is the most threatening elite I have ever seen. Yep. And it was all done just because of the way they had the camera angle. Yep. The cinematography. It was. Is really good. Yeah. I mean, I mean, even when you're fighting Ashram, when he drops in that first time, you're like, man, this is a big brute. This ain't no Tartarus. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's, I just love the way they did that. And it really adds a lot to the, to the game for me. The storytelling was great. It's just that animation just was, I mean, granted, it's, it's in game. So not everything is going to be quite as. Yeah, they're not going to be blur cut scenes. No, but still, it's just like. It could have been better, especially so, something just felt like against some of the other cut scenes in the game. Anyways, but it was good to. And, and this is kind of another one of those. Okay, this is kind of a small climax within the story because you have all right it's the spartan killers coming to the chief it's like okay it's this this is the first like you had chat clock but then this is kind of the first big resistance to chief and then it's also impacting the pilot and you get to it the pilot really breaks out and breaks down it's like okay here's where you really start to answer that question back in halo at the end of halo 4 of chief's humanity and how does he relate to uh someone like the pilot having that connection in there. They're, one of the coolest things about Halo Infinite is just all of the connections that it makes to so many other pieces of the games, the books, the lore within Halo. And by no, and, and by no, the nice thing is by no means you don't need, the, you don't need to know the other stuff. You don't. Cause it still fits. I mean, it fits the story that's being told, which is great. Now, the people that know the lore and have played all the games, they catch the nods to the earlier stuff. It's a huge enhancement. Yep. Which, you know, it's like a certain book that will not be mentioned. <laughs> After re- going through that book and then replaying the mission, the campaign, it shed a new light on a lot of stuff in the game. Like, I know which book you're talking about, and I'm working on catching up. <laughs> yeah. I, there are, I mean, you know, even there are actually several books that tie into Infinite and help enrich it, enrich the story that is told in the game. Which is? Which is the way they need to do that. Yeah. Um, and I, 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 ha- I do admit they did a very good job with that. A lot better than they did in Halo 4. Yes, I would agree. So we had some folks write in their thoughts. We have Bobby and Pens who responded to our Discord prompt as far as <clears throat> the mission Spire and Pelican down. So we'll start with Bobby's. For Spire, he says, Is it the shortest mission ever in the franchise? <clears throat> it sure feels like it re- when replaying, considering it's just basically meet and kill the hunters at the base of the Spire and then the boss at the end. Maybe a handful of brutes and grunts before you reach the hunters area. Overall, when first playing through, though, it was nice to have a bit of breathing room and the calm to reappreciate the architecture and the art style graphics between all the action-focused missions. And when Adjutant Resolution geared up 
for the boss fight. I remember exclaiming in surprise excitement at the hope of more varied bosses later on they're putting in a story boss fight already. <laughs> I think it is I guess we're taking out the lobby missions in Halo 5 Guardians or are we counting those? Cuz I mean if we're counting those, those are the shortest missions <laughs> in Halo history. Uh I would call a mission something that you actually have to play. <laughs> Not just walk through. You actually have to play. You have to go and interact with certain things. There's just, there's no shooting in it. But I mean, I'm trying to think how to actually word this. To go through it. Um, where you actually have to, you have opposition to go against. So combat mission. You no know, opposition. Where there's an actual threat. So you still be shooting something. Well, no. The mall, you don't shoot anything. You just jump in a warthog and run. No, I mean, they're shooting parts before you get to the warthog but part. But the biggest part of it is jump in a warthog and run. It's like only half of it. Like I said, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean it's not a mission because you don't actually have to shoot things. You just run. But you do have to shoot things in order to get to the warthog run. <laughs> they're still shooting in it. There is still shooting in it, Unless yes. you're trying to do a but zero shot. I'm just using it. Going over and pushing a button is not a mission. Right. Okay. So we're discounting those. I, I really didn't like those. They just, they just break the rhythm of the game. Halo 5 storytelling for the campaign was not the greatest. We'll just leave it at that. Yeah. We've discussed that many, many times. I, I don't think this is the shortest mission, because I think you can finish... Uh, as far as missions, you can finish quickly, Nightfall, in Reach. I think you can finish the one on ODST faster, the one with Dutch, than actually Nightfall. Mm, I think that no, one might be shorter. I, I, think, I think that one's still longer. You think so? Because hmm. you, you can finish Nightfall in two minutes. It, no, it's more like four minutes. It's like four and a half minutes. Unless you're doing some really crazy skips. And hello, Hayden. Welcome, Raiders, to the, the podcast. Hope your stream went well, Hayden. Yeah, there's Nightfall, and then there's the... It's the Nature Reserve one in ODST. Nightfall, okay, so 3.30 says Cream Team Feet Kisser. So, okay, so 3.30, Uplift Reserve, yeah. I feel like upper, Uplift Reserve is pretty close to that as well. But yeah, I would say one of those two is the quickest. I don't know if the Spire would is that quick. No. Especially, I mean, you you have a fair amount of enemies to get from the conservatory down the valley and to like defeat the hunters. I feel like that encounter itself is probably about three minutes on a typical run. Definitely the fascist mission in Infinite. Yes, that is true. Let's see. Uplift Reserve has a legendary speed run of 2.22. And Nightfall... Okay, let's talk normal people now. <clears throat> Nightfall <coughs> is 3 minutes, 2 seconds. So, Uplift Nature Reserve is faster. By professionals. But, I mean, if you take the average of it, the professionals are going well, to gonna really... Nightfall, when I was running it regularly, I could consistently get it done in under three and a half minutes. The, the thing with Uplift Reserve, too, is there's, there's... You're not explaining a glitch, too. You're just running by everything. So, in a way, Uplift Reserve is a little bit more of a truer, faster run. Yes, but there's also more variables in that run than in nightfall. Yes. Because uh, to get to okay get that eh, to get bit. that you have to have you have to have a, a really good enemy spawn. For uplift? For uplift, yes. Not really. Well, I, apparently I I was never able to get that spawn because uh I would always get flipped by the stupidest grunt that happened to wander out in the middle of the road. I've never had that problem on Uplift. Or 
I go to the hog. Right. I drive straight through, just make sure I don't get hit by a chopper, and I, I know how to navigate around the choppers and the race yeah. through the valley, hop on the ghost, and the ghost run is the easiest run. Usually my problem was when you make the you start climbing the hill. That's just Oh, that part's something that's part easy. Yeah, until random nade just shows up somewhere. Random nades from where? <laughs> the what? brutes. I rarely get those. Well, I guess I'm the lucky one then. <laughs> I guess you are. Yeah, it, I have never had any kind of luck with speedrunning. It doesn't matter how many times I try. I I mean, I guess on Nightfall you don't have every to time with something some random thing happens that just kills the run. It doesn't yeah, it doesn't stop me from cl- completing the mission, but as far as being a high speed run, well, anyways, if, if we were to go based off of how fast speedrunners can get the missions done and if that would be an indication on which one's faster, then uplift is faster. Yeah. And ODST missions are typically shorter anyways. Moving on, though. Pins writes about the Spire. Spire was a fun mission, but if a bit short, it wasn't a dense mission in regards to the number of enemies, but they did seem to be in some unexpected places. Running it solo on Legendary, the Hunters were no joke. That's true. Make sure you bring some power weapons. The fob capture would be very helpful there. The number of fusion coils around should have made it easier, but splash damage is the thing. <laughs> You gotta throw them from a distance, Pens. <laughs> At least watching brutes go flying was entertaining when a bunch of coils would go off. Once in the spire, I can't help but think of the amazing job done in designing the foreigner architecture in Infinite. It feels similar to what we experienced in previous games, but much older, as it should feel, in my opinion. Meeting Adjutant Resolution was, an unex- was unexpected in that the Halo Rings had only one monitor assigned to them. At that time, it made me wonder why Adjutant Resolution was there. Why were there two monitors on this ring? I recall that in CE Anniversary cutscenes, Guilty Spark had mentioned something about possibly having more than one monitor to help fend off rampancy. I wondered if the foreigners tested something like that on Zeta Halo. I also really liked the new monitor design. The fight with Adjutant Resolution was fun as well. I really enjoyed the boss uh, type fights that were near the end of each level. That last scene also brought... Okay, so that... I think... Oh no, okay. This is still about the Spire. That last scene also brought a bit of odd dynamic out between the weapon and Chief. Up to this point, Chief maintained a professional but caring demeanor. I don't know if it was caring. It. I think he was just kind of on mission. But uh, this is the first time he snaps at her to stop her from doing what she was designed to do. And it leads to the weapon's first questioning as to why Chief does not trust her. I initially thought it had to do with deal with Cortana, although that would be proven wrong later. I mean, in a way, it had to do with Cortana because of just the experience with him and Cortana in the past anyways. Thank you, Pet, for showing up on stream. <laughs> Technically, the pet did not show up on stream. I did see the tail. It was down there. Although although the although the, the uh, door is feeling his wrath. The door is feeling his wrath? That clunk was him attacking the door. Oh. Or attacking a toy attached to the door. I don't know which. Uh, okay. <clears throat> and then we have Pelican Down. Going back to Bobby. Even with the E3 presentation of the mission, it was still satisfying to go through and build the appearance of the Spartan Killer units into combat. My first time, though, I was so reliant on the Mangler for the usual enemies that I had struggled killing the duo of Spartan Killers. Though it was cool to use the upgraded chopper in discovering its energy blades. Only to get skewered to death immediately. (laughs) In the end, though, I was frustrated trying to find the spot where I'm supposed to meet back up with the pilot since it didn't give me a waypoint. It took 10 to 20 minutes of me wandering around until stumbling across the prompt when I was sure I had already gone to that spot previously. It's called the ping. If you ever wonder where you need to go, you just do the ping. It's just down on the D-pad. Anyways. And the cutscene at the end with the pilot was one of the most emotionally impactful in all of Halo for me, to where I took a short break after the mission to collect myself again after hearing the pilot's breakdown and the chief's sense of failure that had been eating at his character. Like I said, the voice acting was great. Animation kind of took it out out a little bit for me, which maybe I shouldn't have let it get to me as much as it did, but, but 
just being so ingrained and in watching it, it's like, ugh. when it's kind of just right there in your face, it's like, oh man, it is what it is though. And then from pins, we've got going into Pelican Down. I was really looking forward to playing what we saw in the E3 demo. There's a lot of ground to cover in this mission and some interesting backstory by Eshram as we disable the first two AA guns. The fight with Hyperius and Tavares was challenging for sure, as you had to move quickly to rearm as the two of them would chew you up between the scrap cannon and the chopper. Once the fight was done, I did wander a bit before the nav point came up to take me back to where the pilot was, but that led to one of my favorite scenes in the game. I found the reaction of the pilot to be understandable given the situation. Also, the impression given was that we would be getting the Master Chief we had in the early games, one that was not very talkative at, at all and was more to the shell of a character, not the one we saw in Halo 4 and 5. However, in taking talking to the pilot, we see that the developed character of John was there and that he was affected by everything that has happened to date. Agreed. Agreed with all that. So thank you, Bobby and Pins, for responding to the prompt in Discord. That is going to draw our podcast to a close for this week. Um, next week, we don't have a topic quite yet, um, but we'll let you all know via social media and on Discord. So make sure you're checking us out both um, on Twitter and in Discord. We've also been uh, getting all the Patreon videos up. So those are now up to date. I haven't sent a note out on Patreon actually yet, but for those that, uh, patrons of ours, the videos, the VODs of the podcast recordings are finally up to date, including through the podcast from last week. So have fun. Go over and check them out. If you're interested in becoming a patron, head over to podtagler.com slash Patreon. Been working on a couple of things in the background as well. Uh, puppy is still striking on, on things and getting things distracted, but we do have a plan for getting a couple of interviews. If people would like to see any interviews from the community, please let us know who you would like to see on the podcast. Uh, I started working on some other things in the back end uh, through stream elements. More news on that to come as things develop. But uh, trying to just get things running off for the new year. gt and &E projects that you have coming up for Podtacular that you want to hint on? Any more Achieving Halo at some point? Or we're going to do finish off a yeah, campaign co-op run at some point? <laughs> achieving Halo, I, I really, I honestly don't know at this point. With current life, there's not a whole lot of time to devote to that. Because each, each one of those episodes can eat anywhere from 12 to 16 hours. It, it's my Master Chief collection. <laughs> yep. My eyes were bigger than my stomach. Anyway, um, I do still, I do have some that are recorded. I just have to get them edited and get them put out. I have some other things I've been thinking about trying. I still have to do some other testing, make sure it's going to work. And I've got some setup to take care of so that uh <clears throat> it doesn't break other stuff i did see something and ubernick posted posted this on his youtube cursed halo 3 this got me really interested i watched that video today i think since now the steam work like you go into the steam workshop and see what's integrated because now i feel like with the steam workshop actually putting those mods mm -hmm. in and playing them with someone will actually be a lot easier now but going through Cursed Halo, going through uh, all those modded campaigns would be actually something fun to do on stream. Mm hmm And if we can get and. if we can get the uh, the dual gameplay that we had we've been talking about for years, actually get that going, I think that might be something that we could do. Hit us up well, on Discord you know, on social if you guys would like to see that. Might, I think we finally might have some PCs capable of doing that now. Yes. This is true. And now, but, I've, got, uh, now I've got three PCs There's set up. Uh, There's <laughs> something I've been thinking about. And uh, I've got some other things to take care of first as far as setup. So I, I, I want to play these mods because some of them, 
Well, a lot of the ones I've seen look just absolutely intense. Um, They're wacky, and but crazy, I and don't. I, love it. I also don't want to install the mods on a system where I actually play Halo. Well, I think that's what's I nice know about the they, Steam Workshop. I know that they've got things separated, and that's fine. I just prefer to have them on their own dedicated machine. That way, if something breaks, I can still fire up Halo and play it. That's what I've got on Xbox. Yeah. <laughs> that you never use. No, I mean, that's why I play Halo on every time. Yeah. It's Xbox. I thought you'd been playing on your PC. No, I've still been mostly playing on my Xbox. I I need to get my desk cleaned up. I need to find my gaming mouse, the wireless one. I don't know where Mine's I put right it. right here. Yes, I have that one, and I don't know where the frick I put it. I thought it was in the drawer that was supposed to be where it lived, and now I don't know where it is. You put it in a safe place. Yeah, safe place that I don't know where it is. Exactly. Right. That's why it's a safe place. <laughs> safe from me, I guess. The person that's trying to use it. It's all right. I put a car park in a safe place for about four years until I looked to my left and it was right there. <laughs> I have looked on my desk. I've looked in drawers. I've looked in other drawers. It's a little bit of a hurricane of a mess down here from the house construction and everything. So I, I just need to take a couple hours to get things straightened out. And I'll probably find it in the whole cleanup, but clean up, rearrange. All right, folks, that's it for us tonight. Thank you for tuning in. We will catch you all next week for the podcast. Uh, for those that are joining GT tomorrow, have fun. Uh, if I'm on, it will be very late towards the end of the game night. Uh, if not, I will catch you all next week for game night. Thank you for listening to Pod Tackler, the unofficial Halo Universe podcast. You can find our podcast on your favorite podcasting service and listen to us live every Thursday night at 8.30 p.m. Eastern Time on Twitch. Check out our website, podtackler.com, and join the community on Discord at podtackler.com slash Discord. If you want to play Halo with us, come join us for Frag and Fridays at 8.30 p.m. Eastern Time. You can find us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. Become a supporter of the show by sharing the show with your friends and family. Or help keep the lights on by subscribing to us on Twitch, donating via PayPal, or becoming a patron alongside Confal, Pins Halo, and Prestige Ace. Until next time, keep on fragging trucks.